Thank you. I, I'd just like to start by saying I'm a little bit hoarse, and for once it's not from singing. <laughs> uh, I've been like this for about a week now, so just uh, apologies for that. Minister, Chairman, Delegates, it is a great privilege for me to bring you this report, my first as General Secretary and our 46th annual Delegate Conference here in the Mount Wolsey Hotel, Tullow, County Carlow. I would like to especially welcome Minister McEntee, and I look forward to her address, which will follow mine. <clears throat> this year, we'll see a major transition of our union. Two years ago, our Deputy General Secretary, Seamus Murphy, retired and is blossoming and looking younger every time we meet him. <clears throat> this year, Des Kavanagh retires after 25 years of dedicated service as General Secretary and more than 40 years as a PNA activist. Des has shown unbelievable commitment to the PNA throughout his whole nursing career, from his early days as a student nurse in Port Rand to the present day. Tomorrow afternoon will be dedicated to Des, the life of Des in the PNA. However, I would like to take this opportunity to highlight a couple of his achievements. Over its 47 years history, the PNA has, through the support of its members and officer board, consistently led the promotion of psychiatric and intellectual disability nursing to improve health care for individuals, families, groups and communities, and shape health policy for the delivery of health services whilst maintaining integrity and ethical practice of mental health and intellectual disability nursing. Twenty years ago, Des led the PNA in becoming a founding member of Horatio, European Un Psychiatric Nurses. When Des commenced an engagement with two psychiatric nurses from Malta and another from the Netherlands, who were pioneering a vision to develop a network of European representatives and international organisations within the field of mental health nursing. In the search for national associations or organisations with psychiatric nurses, it became clear that a minority of nations have ded dedicated organisations as such. Des, who is not adverse to the concept of revolutionary groundbreaking approaches, saw the potential of such a wonderful collaboration and set the course for PNI Ireland to become not only inclusive to the then fledgling organisation, but to support and develop the concept in full. So much so that Des attended the first meeting, which took place in October 2005 in Amsterdam, where the decision was taken to transform the group into an association that we all know now as Horatio. In 2006, Des was elected president of Horatio and was re-elected annually until 2014, when he retired in preparation for his planned retirement from his work with the PNA. Late last year, together with our colleagues in the Faculty of Nursing, RCSI, we welcomed to Ireland the Board of Horatio European Psychiatric Nurses to join us in a symposium. Exploring professional practice, the evolving role of the psychiatric mental health nurses in Europe, and on that special and proud occasion, together with invited guests, it gave us great pleasure to witness Des receiving a richly deserved Lifetime Achievement Award as Fellow of Good Standing from the RCSI Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery. The PNA continues to support the foresight of Des and colleagues, represented by Ashley Culhan, who has recently been appointed as General Secretary of Horatio. And congratulations, Ashley. <laughs> this year, the Office of the Board are once again delighted to sponsor colleagues in participating in the hugely important Fourth Horatio International Festival held this year in Malta. This occasion will afford those attending the opportunity to showcase Ireland's best practice in profession to international colleagues but also to learn, identifying and share knowledge within the profession from up to 25 different countries. 
As you know, DES has a big impact on female nurses. <coughs> and as it turns out, women throughout the public sector. It was only when we honoured DES <coughs> by the Faculty of Nursing at the Royal College of Surgeons last October that a lot of us learned about this impact. In the late 80s and early 90s, DES was highly offended regarding the treatment of temporary nurses, the majority, majority of them being female. These nurses were treated as second-class citizens, remaining on the first point of the scale, irrespective of how many years they had worked. They had no pension entitlements and could be let go with little or no notice. DES was determined to right this wrong and took a case to the Labour Court on behalf of temporary nurses in Carlow and Waterford in mid-1990s. His claim was successful in the Labour Court, which had the effect of addressing this discriminatory abuse of female nurses and also all temporary staff throughout the public service. A great gratitude is owed to him from, for his conviction on this matter. The other highlight which I believe stands out was his drive and leadership of the 24-7 Alliance. The formation of this group of frontline public sector workers emanated from DES's determination that ICTU would not sell out on the premium pay of those on the front line. DES was the catalyst in bringing together these group of workers consisting of nurses, guardi, prison officers, firefighters and ambulance personnel. He was appointed chairman and spokesperson for the group. This speaks consider volumes considering that the PNA had the second smallest membership of that grouping. The Alliance successfully defended the attack on premium pay for frontline public sector workers. Going forward, it is important that we continue to liaise with our frontline workers with similar aims and objectives to ensure terms and conditions of frontline workers are protected. As already mentioned, we will be addressing DES's retirement in more detail tomorrow afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to wish DES and many, Mary many happy and healthy years of retirement and thank you both for your loyalty and commitment to the PNA. As you can see, big shoes to be filled. <laughs> However, I can assure you, as General Secretary, there will be no lack of commitment and dedication from myself, the full-time staff and officer board in continuing to build on the achievements of the PNA heretofore. I believe we have a great team of staff to further progress the objectives of this union. All of our staff leave no stone unturned in the pursuit of the goals of the PNA. Our industrial relations officers, Michael Hayes, Caroline Brilly, and Rory Kavanagh, Ashley Colhain, our research and development advisor, Elaine Melia and Paula Gannon, our office staff, all work tirelessly both during the day and regularly into the evenings and nights on behalf of you, the members. I want to commend and thank them for all their hard work throughout the year. And I also want to thank our outgoing officer board for all their work in the last year. And I look forward to working with the new officer board in what I believe will be a very challenging year. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome all the new members that have been elected onto the board and to also uh, wish all the best to those who have served over the last number of years and dedicated themselves to the PNA Officer Board. So thank you. <laughs> and I'd also like to congratulate Tracy Quigley uh, on being elected as the first female chairperson. And I can... <laughs> And 
and I want to declare that P&A time is now finished, <laughs> as Tracy is a really tough timekeeper, so we're back on to Greenwich Mean Time, so <laughs> bye-bye. <laughs> Tomorrow, we also bid well to Fintan Leahy, our national chairman, who is retiring following four years of hard work and commitment in the role. I wish Fintan and Breda a very happy and healthy retirement and I would also like to thank the partners of the staff and of the board for all their support and patience. And from my own point of view, I'd like to especially thank Leash for her um, support <laughs> and patience throughout the last year. <laughs> Despite many retirements, limited recruitment and the export of our graduates, our nursing membership has remained reasonably stable over the last number of years. However, I'm pleased to announce this year that we have a net increase of 230 nursing members. Our recruitment and retention ca campaign was obviously one of the reasons for this. Most of our recruitment is done by the branch of officials on the ground. I encourage you to continue the good work. Last year, we lost our appeal in the High Court in relation to IFISA recognition, and as a consequence, our IFISA membership numbers are declining. However, I am pleased to report that the National Ambulance Service Representative Association, NASRA, has continued to grow and provide leadership and representation to its members throughout the country. Mick Dixon and Tony Gregg have worked tirelessly on behalf of NASRA members and have had a number of significant successes on cases. They have also continued to campaign for improvements in the ambulance services and have highlighted a number of ongoing issues such as ambulance response times in the national media. The findings in the recent HICWA review of the National Ambulance Service confirmed there are ongoing problems with, with lack of investment and staffing shortages in the service, which, NAS, which NASRA first highlighted over three years ago. And as Mick Dixon pointed out recently, it is one thing to identify the need for more staff in the National Ambulance Service, but management must accept the reality that it is extremely difficult to attract recruits when pay and conditions have been progressively eroded in recent years due to austerity and public service pay agreements. NASRA have made a very strong submission to the Public Pay Commission, demanding, among other things, a reduction in the retirement age from 67 68 to 62 years of age. The restoration of all salary cuts and will be pursuing those demands on behalf of its members in the coming months. <laughs> Following eight years of cutback, both to terms and conditions, and to mental health services, last year saw the beginning of measures to address the issue of recruitment and retention. Our campaign was initiated at last year's conference in the Sleeve Russell. There was such an avalanche of motions in relation to recruitment and retention that a special section of conference was reserved to address the issues. Following this, a special NEC was convened, which mandated us to ballot for industrial action. You, the members, voted resoundingly in favour of industrial action. The industrial action commenced on the 29th of June with a five-phase strategy. After 49 days of industrial action and an unprecedented 14 out of 15 of our claims were satisfactory resolved. <laughs> Among the recruitment issues addressed, the Mental Health Division has given assurances to the PNA that where approval has been granted at local level and forwarded to the division for approval, the entire process will not exceed 28 days. All temporary nurses and 2016 graduates were made permanent. Undergraduate nurse training places increased by 60 in 2016 and will increase by a further 70 this year. The postgraduate course 
with 40 places commenced in UCD in January. And a scoping exercise is due to complete it shortly in relation to health science graduates qualifying as psychiatric nurses through an accelerated process. It is acknowledged that some of the above measures will take four to five years to have an impact on the shortages. We also know that the current peaks in retirements will subside in the next five years. In the meantime, we will continue to rely on overtime, agency, and retired staff to maintain services unless our nurse emigrants are enticed back. I will address this in later in the report. In order to encourage staff availability, the following has been agreed. Part-time staff who wish to increase their hours will be facilitated. Staff working overtime will be paid in accordance with their own hourly rate. Retired staff returning to work in the service as a staff nurse will be paid on the LSI. Mental health services have become increasingly community-based over the past two decades. However, with the removal of the community allowance in 2012, nurses were significantly disincentivized to move to the community, even for promotional posts. A robust case was made during negotiations for the restoration of the allowance. This has now been achieved with the establishment of the new allowance of 5,449 for all nurses who fulfil the criteria. The implementation of Vision for Change has been very slow, with very few of its targets met 11 years on. This was highlighted in the research conducted by the RCSI commissioned by the PNA, an impact evaluation of a vision for change on mental health service provision. This showed a 60% reduction in beds in the 10 years of the policy, yet only 30% of the promised community services were put in place. This once again demonstrates a lack of commitment in the delivery of mental health services and was used like its predecessor, Planning for the Future, as a cost-cutting measure. The majority of our community services operate Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. The symptoms of mental illness do not end at 5 p.m. And I would say the only care after hours for our citizens with mental health problems is family care. This is totally unacceptable. We are 20 to 30 years behind Australia and the UK in the provision of community services, which are predominantly 24-7 in these countries. One of the demands of a recruitment and retention campaign last year, last summer, was the provision of 24-7 community-based crisis services, and this formed part of the final WRC agreement. It was acknowledged throughout the talks that we should establish pilot sites to examine the effect of a 24-7 community service. A subgroup was formed to examine what services we have, review the models of national and international best practice, and make recommendations by the end of 2016. Four months later, still no recommendations. Throughout the discussions within this group, which from a personal point of view have been very frustrating, all we heard was that we must walk before we can run. That is, provide seven over seven services and then examine the concept of 24 seven <laughs> services. This is not only a breach of our WRC agreement, but is also a disservice to the clients and families of those with mental illness. We support the delivery of seven over seven services nationwide, However, that does, still does not address the out-of-hour service required. I am calling on the Minister to support us in establishing four pilot sites, two urban, two rural, to deliver a 24-7 crisis community service to start the process of bringing this country in line with services in the developed countries.
Prior to the election, we heard all the political parties make promises of prioritising mental health and establishing 24-7 crisis services. I call on government to deliver on these promises as a matter of urgency. In preparation for the next phase of Vision for Change, it is our understanding that the Mental Health Unit of the Department of Health have completed an evidence-based review in best practice in the development and delivery of mental health services. Having regard to this review, the PNA wish to draw the government's attention again to phase one of the research mentioned earlier, conducted by the RCSI and commissioned by the PNA. While the study participants identified a multiplicity of prerequisites for the full implementation of Vision for Change, their top priorities were identified as comprehensive staffing and resourcing of community-based services and the provision of 24-7 crisis home care teams and crisis houses as an alternative to hospital admission. The PNA has now proceeded to phase two of an impact evaluation of a vision for change on special health service provision, a national descriptive evaluation project. <clears throat> the areas concentrated in this phase include partnership in care service users and carers, mental health in primary care, child and adolescent mental health services, mental health services for individuals with intellectual disabilities, forensic mental health services, mental health services for the homeless, substance misuse for mental health services, mental health services for people with eating disorders, liaison mental health services, and neuropsychiatry services, and mental health information systems. Part, the first part of that research has been completed and we expect the report uh, to, be, to be completed at the end of the second quarter. But to date, what it is showing is that our CAMS teams, that there's only 37% of community services in the CAMS area, um, <clears throat> and that will be one of the key findings at this stage. But obviously the full report will be out uh, towards the end, the end of June, beginning of July. <clears throat> in view of the extensive research we have conducted and our role in representing the largest group of professionals providing services to those with, those with mental ill health, it is imperative that the PNA are represented on any group established in relation to the new vision. Delegates. In order to advance services, we also need psychiatric nurses to provide leadership and professionalism in the provision of these services. There is a dearth of advanced nurse practitioners in the mental health services, with only 12 nationally. As a result of our dispute, we now have a commitment for the development of three advanced nurse practitioners per CHO area and one in the forensic mental health services. That is an increase of 28. This will provide a platform for the further development of advanced nurse practitioners in line with international standards. Other matters addressed in our agreement, equitable, equitable application of time and resources for nurses undertaking postgraduate courses, clarifications in relation to the application of the series physical assault scheme, that is, there is no requirement to await the outcome of an occupational health assessment if the initial assessment by a medical doctor following assault states that the injury is a result, a result of assault, an assault. The payment should pre proceed with immediate effect. It has also been clarified that there is no requirement that an employee must have availed of or exhausted the provisions of the public service sick pay scheme in order to access the 5 6 injury allowance. At present, we're campaigning to have post-traumatic stress disorder automatically covered under the scheme. To ensure the agreement as adhered to, an implementation group meets on a fortnightly basis, and to date, this has proved to be very effective. 
just to let you know, there is a handbook in relation to the agreement, and we have some of them here at our conference, so if anyone wants some, one of those, please take one. Once again, this dispute showed, showed the commitment of you, the members, to implement the phases of our action, which achieved the desired effect. I commend you for that, and I also wish to commend the work of the branch officials, officer board, and full-time officials during the campaign. Throughout the campaign, we held a number of NECs outlining progress and to review our strategy. At the last of those NECs in Port Leash, prior to reaching a resolution, there was some anxiety in relation to the intern incremental credit, that is the 2011 to 2015 graduates, which had not been resolved. We declared we would not leave them behind. A commitment was given then that we would immediately commence a political campaign with the INMO to ensure the incremental credit was restored. To this end, we held a protest, once again very well attended by PA members, outside the Doyle, Doyle, and we met with Minister Harris twice on the issue. Within six weeks of our commitment, we achieved the restoration of the incremental credit. We were joined by three nurses representing the affected group at these negotiations. And I wish to take this opportunity to compliment Katrina O'Neill from Limerick, Thomas Hare from Clare, and Philip Doyle from Port Leash for their excellent presentations and professionalism in highlighting this anomaly at the meetings with the Minister. Over the last number of years, we have heard commentary after commentary in relation to the new National Children's Hospital, yet there is no mention of the second largest capital project in health. I am speaking about the new 170-bed forensic mental health service replacing the central mental hospital. Building is due to commence next week on the grounds of St. Ita's Port Ran and is due for completion in 2019. I am now calling for immediate engagement to facilitate the smooth transition of the service to the new site. This is a great opportunity for the development of forensic mental health services and to put nursing at the forefront of a centre of excellence in forensic mental health services. Over the years, we have seen the difficulties in recruiting nurses to the service in North County Dublin with approximately 100 vacancies between the mental health and ID service in Port Ran. It is vital that nursing accommodation is included when building the forensic unit. This accommodation can be rented at a subsidised rate to encourage young nurses to work in this service. I would propose that the maximum a nurse could avail of the accommodation should be three years to ensure a steady flow of available accommodation. Almost every year, the lack of child and adolescent mental health services CAMs, throughout the country is highlighted. Unfortunately, little progress has been made. The HSE Operational Plan 2017 states in its executive summary that the population of children nationally is expected to increase by 8,530 between 2016 and 2017, creating an additional demand on child and adolescent mental health services. It is essential that CAM services are properly resourced. Vision for Change promised 100 beds, yet we have only 63 operational beds. This is a reduction from last year. <clears throat> only six of the 12 CAMS beds in St Vincent's Fairview are operational due to lack of staff. As reported in the Irish Examiner on the 11th of April, there are 82 unfilled posts nationally in the CAM services. Of these, 20 are clinical nurse specialist posts. So we not only have under-resourced inpatient services, but also insufficient community services. It is apparent that some of these CNS posts 
are unfilled due to the applicants being deemed ineligible as they do not fit the criteria. And this was addressed in one of the motions this morning. In order to fulfil this criteria, a nurse needs five years post-registration experience in working in CAMS and have a higher diploma or master's in child and adolescent psychiatry. The majority of nurses are unable to fulfil this criteria as a result of the limited services and very few nurses would have five years experience working in CAMS. And the postgraduate course is only available in the last three to four years. Therefore, there is a very small proportion of nurses who would fulfil the criteria. Hence, the large number of vacancies. <clears throat> the criteria is over restrictive and requires review. In the short term, there is a need to introduce candidate CNS posts to alleviate this recruitment difficulty. We need NRS to be an assistance in recruiting, not a hindrance. <laughs> and we need immediate engagement with the NRS and their advisors to find a resolution to this problem. The delivery of intellectual disability services has changed over the last number of years with the decongregation of services and the development of the social care model. The role of the ID nurse is being severely challenged by senior managers. During recent discussions on the decongregation of Aris Attractor, one senior manager had the audacity to state with the movement of clients to community houses under a social care model, nurses would not be required and believe this, and that the nurses could upgrade to social care workers. This statement is absolutely outrageous. <clears throat> Of course, our IRO, Caroline Brilly, vehemently opposed this disgraceful and disrespectful comment. This contempt of the nursing profession will not be tolerated and will be challenged at every level. <laughs> Intellectual disability nurses are also regularly being put in a vulnerable position by their managers with our attitude to the administration of medication to clients. A culture has developed in these ID services where non-nurses, after only two days training in medication management, are administering medication. Nurses are being told by their managers, many of them nurse managers, that if they are on duty with a non-nurse, either can administer the medication. I wrote to the Nurse and Midwifery Board in March outlining this scenario and I highlight some of the key elements of the response. When delegating a particular role or activity, the nurse must take account of several principles. Assess the degree of work involved in the delegation. Take into account the level of experience, competency, role and scope of practice of the person taking on the delegated task. Do not delegate to junior colleagues or other healthcare workers tasks and responsibilities that are beyond their colleagues' competence to perform. <coughs> Ensure appropriate assessment, planning, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of the delegated role or activity. The nurse or midwife who is delegating a particular role or activity, the, de the delegator, is accountable for the decision to delegate. This means the delegator is accountable for ensuring that the delegated role or activity is appropriate and that resources and supervision where required are available. The response further goes on to reference the guidance to nurses and midwives and medication management, 2007, describing the responsibilities and conduct expected of nurses and midwives in their involvement in medication management, which provides for the standard of care expected by patients. 
In the interest of patient safety, utilising a skill mix for the purposes of the administration of medicines should not lower this standard. Our own intern nurses, with over three years' training, have to be supervised and countersigned when administering medication, yet it is somehow acceptable in the ID services for non-nurses after two days' training to be deemed competent to administer medication. <coughs> the full response has been sent to all branches in the last weeks for distribution and I would advise that this response is brought to the attention of nurse management and all nurses in the services. Nurses must exercise extreme caution when delegating, and in particular, the administration of medication. In 2014, the HSE and Trinity College undertook a joint review of ID nursing in Ireland and tasked the steering group with identifying the future needs and direction of the Ireland ID. The PNA, as one of the stakeholders, was part of this steering group. The, the report was to set out a clear pathway for ID nursing and recommend clinical nurse specialists and the A&P roles for RNIDs in order to achieve higher levels of care provision for people with intellectual disabilities. <clears throat> However, the report Shaping the Future of ID Nursing in Ireland has yet to be published by the HSE, despite being completed last year. The PNA call on the HSE to publish this report, which would overhaul ID nursing and bring it in line with best practice as evidenced in the UK services, to ensure that people with intellectual disabilities receive nurse-led, person-centred care. <laughs> By delaying the publication of this report, the HSE are failing in their obligation to provide equitable health and social care for people with intellectual disabilities across their lifestyle. Care that should be provided by the only group of professionals specifically trained and educated to work with this vulnerable population, the RNID. <laughs> This ongoing devaluing of the ID nurse has got to stop. To this end, we are arranging a special one-day meeting for all ID members in head office on the 18th of May to address these issues. <clears throat> Although we have industrial peace in the public sector for the moment, our members in the private services in St. Patrick's Hospital are facing severe challenges with the attack by the hospital management on their defined benefit pension scheme. Hospital management have unilaterally decided to close the defined benefit scheme with effect from the 2nd of June coming. Agreement was reached between hospital management, the trustees and pensions board under a section 50 application in 2013 to close the defined benefit scheme for future service accrual. Defined benefit members would now be forced into the defined contribution scheme for further service. The defined benefit scheme would continue in operation with a number of amendments to the benefits to ensure the past rights, albeit reduced, will be protected. It is totally unacceptable for hospital management to unilaterally close the scheme without any consultation with the members, the representative bodies, or even the trustees, other than to inform them the scheme will close. <clears throat> Considering the management approach to this recent agreement, it will be very difficult to have any trust and engagement with the hospital management into the future. An inter-union group meeting of those affected by the closure took place two weeks ago with an attendance of over 150. A decision was taken to ballot for industrial action up to and including strike. The ballot commenced yesterday 
and will conclude next Wednesday. A very well attended inter-union protest took place last Wednesday and again yesterday. This disgraceful treatment of loyal staff to the service has resulted in this unprecedented action by our members. <coughs> our members have been left with no option but to resort to this action and have our full support. Once again, we have another restructuring of the health services with the establishment of the community health organisations, <coughs> the CHOs. For those of us around long enough, the new structures have a distinct, distinct similarities to the old health boards, which were deemed not fit for purpose in 2005. <coughs> again, the senior administration positions have been put in place in the first instance throughout the nine CHO areas, and again, when it comes to any restructuring of the health service, we see a significant increase in senior administration management posts. As reported in the Sunday Times on the 9th of April, 35% increase in directors in the last two years, earning salaries of between 98,000 and 147,000. The number of grade eight senior managers has risen by almost 20% from 994 to 1,179. For a service that almost replicates that of pre-2005, we must ask, why is there a need for 1,179 grade eights when 11 were deemed capable of running the services prior to 2005? <coughs> While all of this was happening, we had to resort to industrial action to address our issues in relation to recruitment and retention of nurses. Surely the government's priority and emphasis should be to ensure sufficient frontline workers in the first instance. <clears throat> By contrast, when it comes to putting nurse management structures in place, there is no urgency. As part of the settlement of the recruitment and retention dispute, it was agreed that we would have a separate forum to address the mental health CHO nursing structure. Despite numerous requests to meet, we only had our first engagement in February, almost six months later. We have sent a proposal to HSE management and are due to meet early next month. It is imperative that a robust nurse management structure is put in place to ensure effective government, uh, governance. At present, we have areas, area directors of nursing covering huge, expansive service areas, which are unsustainable, leading to gaps in governance. <laughs> Delegates, it is my understanding that the report of the Pay Commission is due to be published within the two next two weeks. The Commission's remit is to gather and present facts and not to make recommendations. <clears throat> Following the report, we must prepare ourselves for negotiations in relation to pay. It is essential that we not only achieve pay restoration, but also ensure that substantial progress is made <laughs> and measures are put in place to ensure that nurses becomes, nursing becomes an attractive job. <clears throat> Over the last number of years, the government has done a great job in building a culture in which every student nurse saw their future post-qualification in the UK, Australia, Canada, or indeed any health service other than Ireland. We now need to ser serious commitment to replacing that culture with a commitment to making Ireland a country in which nurses are not just welcome and appreciated, but appropriately rewarded. A country in which young nurses can see potential for a meaningful, safe and satisfying career. After a very expensive recruitment, and camp recruitment campaign in the UK, which the PNA supported on our websites and other areas, the net benefit was that nine psychiatric nurses applied 
and six accepted posts, some of whom left within a few months. Also, despite our recruitment and retention agreement, there has been very little impact on the number of vacancies. <laughs> As illustrated in the table below, there are very high level levels in Dublin and Louthmead. As we can see, Louthmead has 47, 45 vacancies, St. Edith's Mental Health Services 28, St. Edith's ID Services 60, Lindara Child and Adolescents uh, 15 plus 8 uh, development posts, and St. Lomans Tala 45. And you can see that the number of graduates who stayed Amazingly, only six stayed in the Lloyd's Mead services out of 19. Uh, nine out of 14 in Sedita's in the mental health side, six out of nine, and 14 out of 26 in the Lindaris and Lomond services. The failure to retain graduates is very pronounced in Lloyd's Mead, with just over 30% staying. This is highly unusual for a service outside Dublin. These figures tell their own story that this country has a serious problem recruiting nurses. In our submission to the Commission, we have highlighted the following. The public sector is competing to recruit nurses with the private sector and internationally with the UK, Australia and Canada. The private sector are offering sign-on fees of up to €6,000 and also offering enhanced incremental credit. Terms and conditions are far more attractive in the UK, Australia and Canada. The HSE need to be innovative in their approach to recruiting nurses. Areas which need to be addressed are subsidised housing, any new capital bill, as already mentioned, on HSE land should include nursing accommodation to be offered at a subsidised rate for between two and five years. The NHS, for example, plan to provide 20,000 such units in the UK in the next few years. As our services become more community focused, subsidised meals should be provided for community based nurses. There must be demonstrable commitment to ongoing postgraduate education, and there must be significant career enhancement opportunities with further provision of CNS and ANP posts. Just up the road in Belfast, the first point of the staff nurse nursing scale is above that of the max of the healthcare assistant scale. It is highly insulting and, in and offensive that our staff nurses must reach the fifth point of the scale before they bypass the max of the healthcare assistant scale. Our staff nurse with a four-year honours degree is responsible for the supervision of healthcare assistants, yet until year five are paid less than those healthcare assistants on the max of the scale. This anomaly must be addressed in the pay talks. <laughs> It is imperative nurses are treated as no less a professional than the therapy grades, and our salary scale needs to replicate that of the therapy grades, which would also address the anomaly in relation to the healthcare assistant scale. Please note the comparative scales. And as you can see, the staff nurse starts at 29,000. This is since the 1st of April, 122, and a healthcare assistant on the top of the scale is on 33,900, and they start at 26. So at stage three, point three, they're higher than the first year staff nurse. We must insist that the first point of the staff nurse scale is equivalent to the first point of the therapy grades. That is 34,969. And you see that in your address there. <laughs> If there is not substantial progress made in relation to this in the pay talks, I believe we should reject any proposed pay deal 
and commence a campaign to deliver a fair and attractive salary for nurses. And I am delighted that that motion was passed, the off of the board motion was passed with that sentiment this morning, that we will not be accepting anything less uh, going forward in the pay talks. <laughs> We have suffered in a very painful way with pay reductions of up to 20%, 25% over the past eight years. And I say to government, it is now your turn to deliver by appreciating and valuing our nurses. <coughs> the, P and <laughs> the PNA has demonstrated over its long history that we never shirk a challenge. And colleagues, I know that when we face this challenge, you, our members, will face up to it and deliver. <clears throat>